previously on Eric the Car Guy. Feels like it needs a couple of love taps. We are bolted in. Ugh, they go over your ear, not in it. Well, thanks, Ben Pack, for making a solid lift. If we have a code for this O2, we know why. That seems to be working for now. Welcome to part four, which we hope is the exciting conclusion of the engine replacement of the 2004 Acura TL. Wish me luck. Guess I can claim my seatbelt back. These fuel injectors. You know, as long as we're here, might as well hook that air conditioner back up. And that's just those four fasteners that secure it to the front of the engine. Just another one of those fiddly things. Once you get one started, the rest go in a little easier. Here's the connector for the cl compressor clutch, which that attaches to the fan shroud. This one was tricky to get to. Got the plug for the back. It's a little clip, but I'm gonna wait on the clip till I get this fastened down. I'm gonna use quarter inch tools here. You break the internals inside the alternator, you suck. Yeah, you just need to secure this. If you over tighten this, you'll damage the internals of the alternator. So use quarter inch tools, snug it, you're done. Restore the insulation. That's fan stuff. That's this is stuff for our radiator when we get to that point. Remember that VTEC solenoid? It's real easy to connect up here. Ah. Another ground on this engine mount. The cameraman's happy he can actually see that. Secured. All the stuff in the back is hooked up. We did that when it was off the ground. I'm gonna jump back over here, connect fuel lines and heater hoses and the rest of the electrical connections there. We are very close to uh, mounting this intake back on here. Once we get that, we're kind of like a radiator away and some fluids and an oil change from driving away. Let's start with a fuel line. Oh, maybe I should wait. Maybe I should do the uh, heater hoses first because they're down underneath. And try to work from the bottom up. And these guys are just put in the back there. They sort of lay where they want to go. One in there. One there. Let's do the big ones. These are different and then like when you push the connector in, you gotta push the lock down. So just, you don't push the connector down, you just sort of pull the lock and it secures itself. Let's put that sensor in that we took out. Just putting a little bit of silicone paste on this O-ring to uh, make sure it doesn't roll around when we tighten it. I think it was a 17. It was a 17. Coolant lines, I think. This one goes here. We have another one? We do, but that one goes with the intake. In fact, I might not want to put that clamp down because the intake may have a couple of those. We swatch, swap from one engine to another. Uh, so fuel line, we're right here. And this, just make sure you get the, uh, this part of the clip lined up with the holes. Clip it in. And then, I've got my fancy cover. Remember this guy? This helps keep it extra secure. Let's put this intake manifold on. I'm gonna use the new intake manifold. I'm hoping, taking the rags out. It won't run with these stuck in those holes. Uh, reusing these steel gaskets, I got no problem doing that. I've done it several times. So don't worry about that. But my concern is, is that everything hooks up because we're going from a manual to an automatic and I don't know if there's differences here or not. That works, that works. I think this goes down here. This goes up here. Now I got it. This is gonna go up here, but I'm gonna wait until I get the snorkel on. This stuff, okay, I got one that lines up here just fine. 
I got one that lines up underneath just fine. We're all good. I just need to position some hose clamps. All right, cameraman Brian was asking just a moment ago, how do you know where all the connectors go and how do you keep track of everything? The easy answer would be very carefully. Probably should have hooked this clamp up underneath first. But part of it is some of these clamps will only go on one way. So one clamp will, or one connector will only fit one device. So you're, you're lucky in that sense to where that often is true, but it's not always true. So I was telling cameraman Brian that like on the assembly line, what they do is you'll see somewhere there's these marks like on the intake manifold and stuff and, and everywhere on the vehicle there's little marks. And as the, as a vehicle goes through the assembly process, there's somebody that makes a mark because they've signed off on it. That's their mark. So when they do it, they've checked it. So they've checked to make sure all the connectors are and everything are in place. And I sort of go through a similar process in that I try to check and double check everything I'm reconnecting just to make sure that it's in place. Now I don't necessarily put marks on everything, but the process is the same. It's, it's a, you know, one person looks at the same thing, another person comes and looks at it again, and they all sign off as they go. They say, okay, it's good, let's go, it's good, move on. That is a practice that I try to employ when doing a big job like this, where you've got a lot of connectors, a lot of things to, to do. In fact, you see that little dot right there? Somebody put that little dot there after they installed this. And you can't get in a rush and forget something. With this many things to remember, super easy to forget. And I've done it. I've left something loose in the past. Not intentionally. It just happens. But you do your best to try and minimize it. I've got all my coolant lines under there. Under the uh, throttle body all connected. This is all good. Intake's on there. I think before I nail the intake down though, since I'm right here, and I've got all the stuff. I'm gonna put the starter in, it's just there. Put me in coach, I'm ready to play. These are tricky because I got the stuff around the outside so I just pull it back, make sure the metal's making contact and then push it in. If you sort of miss that, you'll get a bad connection and uh, intermittent starting. Here's my starter cable. Need to reconnect something from the engine harness. This guy came up from underneath, sort of comes in sideways. There you are. I have to leave this loose because it needs to attach to that brace, the strut brace goes across the top there. I don't even think I have the fasteners for it. No matter, we still have what we need. A positive battery cable and the starter. This guy's a 12. Same thing as with the alternator. You, you turn this too much, you'll break the internals of the starter. So be careful. Groovy. Got the intake manifold here. I'm going to start these with my fingers. I've got two of the nuts that were separated. But then I'm going to do something you're going to hate. And that's run them down with my impact. Oh yeah, you're going to hate it. You're going to be screaming at the screen. Eric! Eric! You're doing it wrong! If that engine explodes, it's because you did that! Take secure. Now with the upper plate. Awesome, there aren't any left over. Well, here he goes again. It's called trigger control, kids. 
And this has a variable trigger. I can give it just a little bit or I can go all the way. And for this stuff, I'm just doing a little bit. How about we put a power steering pump back on this? This goes there. I need to find, uh, I got one. Yeah, ground connections, super easy to forget, but there isn't much that's more important, aside from the power connections. He. <laughs> Ooh, we don't wanna forget about this clamp. That's one thing I find myself forgetting most often. It's the clamps. Those are the things that get me. Before I put the hoses on, or put the hoses in my way, put the serpentine belt on. Serpentine belt. How does it go? Well, check the underhood sticker. <laughs> Smooth pulleys go on this side, ribbed pulleys go on this side, and then you just sort of figure it out from there. This and my 1719 are some of my favorite wrenches, and right here is why. It goes like that. Like I said, rib side goes towards the rib things and the smooth side goes towards smooth things. High pressure hose, our cool little caps. Low pressure. Let's uh, put this on. So while I'm over on the other side, hooking the power steering back up, I notice this hose is just sort of sitting there and I'm like, what did that go to? I'm asking myself, I'm looking at it. I'm like, it's not a fuel line, it's a returnless system, EVAP. Then I look at the purge control solenoid, which is this, which is where it's supposed to hook up and the bottom part of it's broken off. Lucky for us, we've got a spare off the old engine. Hey, the bottom part was broken off. And there's a little more to the pictures we'll see when we get over to the old one. See a little more of the picture. There's this hose down here. Now we figured out where that hose goes. Earlier when I was talking about, you know, all the different things that you need to connect, as I'm reconnecting things, I'm looking everywhere at different angles. If you don't know where a hose goes or something, go to the other side of the car and look at it. You might, that different vantage point might just give you a clue as to where it's supposed to be. And we'll just put it back on to this vehicle. This clips on here. There we are. We found out where the hose goes. Before I undid this little part of this air tube and I wanna reconnect it before I get too far here or else I really, I'll forget it for good. I went looking for a lower fastener for the battery tray, but looking at this, Looks like there's only the three, one there and those, which is darn nice. Speaking of the battery tray, if you wanna get picky, the ones that have the paint on them usually go up top. I wanna get that air box in here. These need to connect onto part of the air box, or they should, but it's okay to leave them disconnected, these two clips right here. It's okay to leave them disconnected because it makes changing the air filter a lot easier. I'm gonna wait and put the upper part on until I've got the uh, radiator hoses connected. This, like I said, attaches to that brace. Another fastener here, so I normally sit like that. I, I think I might have that goofy fastener. Or I can just use this one that was left over from that EVAP stuff we just did. It's nice and long. There's nothing else that'll just hold it into place. Let's get that radiator in. You peeing on the floor. <laughs> and all over me. It peed on me. Thank you, radiator, for peeing on me. Radiator. Oh, and please note the uh, rubber dealies are still on here. 
I just need to guide them down into place. I probably could have cleaned that up a little bit, I know. There's all kinds of complaints you can have about my work here today. Complain away. To better serve you, this repair is being recorded. Anytime I see electrical connections, I just go for it. I don't like to miss electrical connections. That one we can actually probably get from underneath. I've said this in the past, I try to get these sort of in the same spot they were. They seem to seal better that way. Now, this little piece, I don't know if you saw it, there's a little slot here that goes with this. That's how they go together. That's how I know how it goes in. Let's tighten those tens before I forget. Air box. The filter. I think on the stock ones, they mark these, yeah, here, up. It's marked up. Up goes while well, you figure it out. It's like we've had some difficulty with this in the past. Shame, really. This is where I was talking about this wire clips onto. If you don't clip these back on, it makes filter replacement easier. In case you were wondering what this was, it's a map sensor. Not a bad idea to coat these screws with little anti-seize because they do have a tendency to break. Yeah, well, that's just spinning. Well, two out of four ain't bad. Isn't that how the song goes? No, not quite. Yeah, I know. The new batteryless car runs without a battery. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's jacked up anyway. Reconnect that lower radiator hose, uh, change the oil and uh, filter. Oh, I guess I can do like a dipstick now. This new dipstick, as you can see, is broken off. We will replace it with one that is not broken. That's why I recommended removing it when you start, for that very reason. We have an electrical connector for this fan. Click. Uh, we have this one for the AC. Need to attach, especially anything around the serpentine belt, which you can clearly see, I'm gonna have to redo a little bit because I sort of missed the uh, air compressor a little bit. There, that's better. Look at things from different angles. You will see it in different ways. And lastly, our hose clamp. Yeah, it was something like that. Aside from putting the hood on, changing the oil, putting the wheels back on obviously, we're, uh, we're done. Hey, look, this one's got a good drain plug. So the crush washer, the thread's sort of getting bedded here and sometimes it's stuck on pretty good. I just take my wrench and these channel locks, just basically unscrew it from the drain plug. They say to replace these every oil change and I usually wait till they're smooshed out like this and you have to take them off like I just took it off so I can usually get a couple of oil changes out of them but if you absolutely want to make sure that there's no drips on your driveway change these out whenever you change the oil. See how bad this oil filter is on here? Ugh, bad enough. Yeah you really don't need to tighten oil filters with a wrench yet I see it so often. Make sure the gasket isn't there. Don't ask me how I know that. It's kind of embarrassing. How do you know? Because I left the gasket on there once and finished the oil change and went to drive it outside and it left a massive puddle of oil all the way out of the shop. So it's not like you couldn't tell who did it. And there was a trail leading right to me, the guilty party. So double gasketing oil filters, very messy. And you may ask yourself, hey Eric, are you putting those wheel locks back on? My answer, nope. They're going in the glove box with uh, everything else. I'm gonna think of it, it might be easier to get that splash shield up in there without bolting these down. One last check of the radiator petcock to make sure it's tight. These go in much easier than they come out, or they're supposed to. It should all be pretty much the same. 
Although there might be broken or missing ones, so look for critical areas like up in here and do those first. So that way you're sure that you've got the critical ones covered. Because if this one in here comes loose, it'll rub against the tire. Not only make a weird noise, but it'll also pretty much render it useless. I'm not gonna bother with the tire pressures. If you look at the tires, there isn't much left. <laughs> the ones in the back anyway. And the ones in the front, I'll just warn any of you that have one of these cars, put Michelins on it and be done with it. Put anything else but Michelins on it, you won't be happy. I know they're expensive, but owning and maintaining a luxury sport vehicle is expensive. Fill it up with oil and coolant and we're done. I leave the oil cap up there when there is an oil in an engine. Helps remind me that there's no oil in the engine. Just gonna check if I got the right attachment. And I do. You'll love this. It's an old brake fluid bottle. Screw in funnel. Just take five quarts. 520. The owner has supplied very special synthetic oil. My handy spill free funnel. This cooling system takes blue coolant. Cross your fingers and hope nothing's leaking out down below, which you should probably check, just to be sure. Still no battery for this car, so I'm gonna use my MicroStart. I'll uh, put a link in the description to my review on that, and you'll see that <laughs> it can start an engine up with uh, without any battery at all. It's the big moment. It's either gonna work or not. I might have to uh, put the charger on it. And it's okay that it's cranking a long time like this. And I say that because that will allow all the oil to circulate through the engine. It's been sitting for a long period of time, so there's no oil up in it. So in a way, it not starting like this is kind of an advantage. I'm gonna try something. You wanna live? Well, I think it just blew the fuse on my uh, micro start. Yep, sure did. So, overheated it. So, I, I killed my micro start. <laughs> As you can see, we have installed a battery. We borrowed one from another vehicle. It's not the correct battery, but it's better than no battery. At least get this thing running. A little sad about my micro start dying, but I overheated it. You heard how long I was cranking it. Kick this over into hyper pursuit mode. Also closing the door helps because it turns off the dome lights. Dome lights do draw some amps. So if you want every electron, close the door, turn the radio off, everything else. It's alive. It's running a little rough. And it's got kind of a misfire. Really not sure what that's all about. But it is running. It's quiet.
Those are all plugged in. But a flashing check engine light usually means some kind of misfire. Which I do have a flashing check engine light. But it doesn't seem happy. Not 100% happy. It's happy enough to be running, but not much more. No drop at all. I think it's got a bad coil pack. I think I know which one it is. I unplugged this back coil pack, nothing. And pull it out and check for spark. See if we got spark coming out. If we do, we'll pull the plug. If we don't, we'll take one of the coil packs out of the old engine and put it in this one. Sounds like spark. The right kind of plug doesn't really look bad okay if this new plug doesn't work uh, maybe the injector is not plugged in all the way but I'll be looking at the injector next because obviously the coil pack works because we got spark and it's firing but uh, power balance test says uh, it's got nothing on this cylinder so it's either not getting spark or not getting fuel. Spark is easier to check than fuel. Honestly, in my experience with Hondas, it's more likely to be spark than fuel. Therefore, I go here first. But remember that catalytic converter is also clogged, but that's not gonna cause this misfire. That actually feels smoother. It's a bad plug. Sounds fine now. All this smoke, get used to that. It'll be like that for a little bit. It's got some stuff that's got to burn off first. But that is running nice now. Very nice. Okay, now it's running smoothly. Check engine's light not flashing or anything, not even on anymore. Uh, I'm just gonna take a real quick check underneath look for any leaks, and I'm gonna back it out the door, bleed the cooling system, take it for a quick drive. I don't see any leaks. Sounds good, too. Before I back it up, I know the power steering fluid's low because we removed it and everything. Just gonna top it off. This car has drive-by wire. That means I can't sit out there and hold the throttle open by hand. I have to do it inside the vehicle. I've actually got cameraman Brian out there watching for the cooling fans, but I'm still going through the same procedure to bleed the cooling system. I turned the uh, temperature all the way to hot, then I turned it off so that the fan wasn't blowing, so, but that means the uh, water valve for the HVAC is open, so it'll circulate coolant through the heater core and hopefully remove any air that's in the system. Once that's complete, we should be able to go for a drive, but. No check engine lights, nothing. All right, the cooling fans just came on. Uh, I know that all the air is out of the system. I'm gonna top it off. Let's go for a drive. No hood. <laughs> I like driving without hoods. It's just fun. Seems to run smooth. Temperatures bang on where it's supposed to be. RPMs are good, no check engine lights. This is gonna be a quick uh, down the street and back because we kinda don't have plates. You can tell the exhaust is restricted. I'm not getting full power. So that catalytic converter is a problem that needs to be addressed. 
and it's a traffic time of day. So I, I've got what I needed. I'm literally just heading back to the shop. This is uh, not the time of day to go for a drive. <laughs> we'll just be sitting here staring at stuff. But I know what I need to know. It doesn't go the full RPM range. And like I said, I suspect that's because that third catalytic converter is clogged, but it does run well. That restricted exhaust will hamper power delivery and it will happen at the top end just like that. And it's fully warmed up, so I should get it all. I can, it's struggling to get to the red line. And that engine was really clean inside, so it's, it's not that, it's not the engine. We're gonna take it back in, put the hood on, and then it's out of here. Guess what, guys? That's right, new aftermarket converter we're gonna replace this one with. Anything's better than what's on there now. Let's get that one off, get this one on, and then we'll go for a test drive. We just had the front fasteners off. Those should come off no problem. These back ones, eh, I think a little bit of penetrating oil back here should uh, hopefully help. Breaker bar, that's how I'm gonna try and kick things off. Uh, these were 14s. They've rusted down a little bit. I'm lucky today. Oh, almost. Almost had them all. Maybe I can hammer a 13 onto that. It's all getting ready to celebrate. <sighs> Gonna need heat. It was made with fire, it will submit with fire. Don't touch it, it's still hot. The rest will be easy. We already had these apart. Well, this is unexpected. I guess I'm gonna have to drop this down right here to give it enough travel to get this out. Here I was with all these tools at the ready, thinking I had this. Well, I didn't. Let's show you the restriction. Well, first, you can see all the debris that's just down in there. That's going to do us no good at all. This new cat doesn't have studs like the old one does, so I've had to come up with nuts and bolts to make this work. Also, it did not come with any new gaskets, or the old catalytic converter actually has provisions to put a gasket there. So with the absence of new gaskets, I'm forced to pretty much bolt this together and hope for the best, but as you saw from the old catalytic converter, this thing's gonna be a far sight better. I mean, at least there's gonna be the ability of exhaust to flow through it, and hopefully it will also add some catalyst stability and clean up our emissions. I'm doing these backwards because there's no way for me to get the bolt through here. Well, that one I can, but most of them were kind of too long to do it that way. So I'm kind of going backwards, but it'll, it'll fasten together. It'll work. Now let's go for a drive and see how it does. Less traffic, also a working catalytic converter. Let's see how it performs now. Last time I was holding back. Ooh, we're out ahead of traffic this time. Much better, way better. Calling this one done. Engine replacement, 2004 Acura TL, 3.2 liter. 
it's kind of straightforward. You will run into some things. As I stated at the beginning of the video, I took this engine and transmission out of the top. In the past, I've dropped everything out via the cradle that I showed you as well. Either way it works. I just did it this way this time to more closely mimic the way you might do it. Uh, you might not have the provisions if you're in your garage or driveway or something like that to drop the cradle at the bottom. So you may be doing it this way. That said, we got it. It's done. Uh, that catalytic converter made a world of difference in the performance. Exhaust restrictions are like that. If the exhaust can't get out, it can't draw new air in. And if it can't get air in and exhaust out, it's not gonna make the power that it normally would make. I suspect that there was a misfire or some other issue with the old engine, clogged all the catalytic converters and caused the problems that eventually led to its demise. Well, almost demise. Whatever was wrong with it, we don't know. I never diagnosed it. But now it has a new working engine, a new free-flowing exhaust, thanks to our new catalytic converter, all is right with the world. Yes, there was some contempt on my part working on this vehicle, partly because it didn't seem like the owner took a whole lot of care of it. That being said, what I ended up doing is I actually made an ETCG1 video about that specifically. Link to that will be around somewhere when it's available. Anyway, the job is done, the car drives away, everyone's happy. I hope you've enjoyed watching this engine replacement series on this 2004 Acura TL. I enjoyed making it. If you have automotive questions, I would ask that you head over to ericthecarguide.com. If you wish to connect with me socially, I can be found on Google+, Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. Close each of my videos. Be safe, have fun, stay dirty. See you next time.